in this set of lectures, I intend to cover crystallography, starting from an almost zero knowledge of the subject to things like polycrystals, interfaces, phase transformations, and how to interpret information from some quite sophisticated advanced instruments. I'll also try and relate structure and properties. To begin with, uh, let's think about a definition of a crystal. A crystal basically has long range order. That means that if I start off from this red atom, I know that I'm going to get another red atom once I've covered a distance which is equal to a repeat distance here. No matter how long I carry on, I will see the same repeat pattern. There is long range order in a crystal. That is in contrast to a material which is amorphous, in which the atoms are arranged at random. I cannot conclude that if I go this distance in the same direction, I will end up at another position, equivalent position, where I have the same atom. A consequence of this is that the properties of a crystal are anisotropic. So for example, you can see here the distance is smaller than the distance in this direction. And that means that the mechanical properties might be different and other properties uh, similarly vary with the orientation along which you do measurements. That is not the case with an amorphous material where the properties tend to be isotropic. That means they are the same in all directions. So typical examples of crystals include, for example, quartz or iron, and of an amorphous material would be window glass or metallic glass which is produced by cooling liquid at a sufficiently fast rate so that the atoms do not have a chance to order. So to summarize, crystalline materials have long range order and are likely to be anisotropic. That means their properties vary with direction uh, along which the measurements are made. In contrast, an amorphous material will tend to be isotropic. Now, crystals are not necessarily solids. They can also be liquids. And liquid crystalline materials are extremely well known or, or well used these days. Uh, they consist of uh, molecules which are uh, anisotropic themselves and tend to align in some way to produce uh, long-range order. So liquid crystalline polymers, for example, will have properties with very with orientation. And of course, they are liquids because they are able to flow. Since these uh, uh, cigar-shaped molecules or anisotropic molecules tend to align with each other during the flow, they will have different uh, properties for light passing through that liquid along different orientations or between cross polars. So crystals can be solids or they can be liquids. And in the case of liquids, they can flow while still being crystalline. This slide shows some very elegant crystals, colorful fluorescing crystals. And this is what a normal person would recognize as a crystal, looking quite beautiful with very strong, uh, sharply defined facets and generally aesthetically pleasing. So these represent shapes of crystals which have developed over a long period of time at sufficiently high temperatures so that they create uh, shapes which are not far from equilibrium. And a lot of crystallography, before the advent of uh, things like diffraction and the Bragg law and so on, was based on measurements made on shapes of naturally occurring crystals. But it's important to realize that in engineering applications, the shapes that we require of crystals can be determined by many other factors than their equilibrium shapes. So for example, this is a single crystal uh, turbine blade, which is used in the hottest part of uh, an aircraft engine. Basically, it's uh, grown as a single crystal because 
the boundaries between crystals have a lot of free volume and therefore diffusion happens readily and these blades can get longer during service. If you eliminate the boundaries by making these as single crystals, then you increase the life of the turbine blade. The shape, of course, is determined by the aerodynamic requirements of a turbine blade rather than uh, by an equilibrium uh, surface, a faceted crystal. And similarly, when we look at um, the silicon single crystals that are used to make uh, electronic circuits, they are basically grown as cylinders from liquid. And then those cylinders are sliced to produce uh, transistors and integrated circuits and all the rest of it. Here we see that the anisotropy of a crystal uh, leads to variations in the stiffness of the crystal. So the modulus of the crystal varies with direction along which it is measured. There's another uh, feature that you should notice and that is that these images are not uh, of arbitrary shape. They actually have some symmetry. Now both of these uh, materials are cubic. Uh, cubic crystals, silver and molybdenum, they are both metals. And you can see that the properties along certain directions are exactly equal. Oops, are exactly equal. In other words, even though the property varies as a function of orientation along equivalent directions, and I'll come back to this later, they might be identical because of symmetry. Although we use single crystals in engineering applications, uh, the vast majority of materials that we deal with in real life are polycrystalline. So here is an optical micrograph of um, nickel, and these are all individual crystals which are packed together to fill space. And here you can see some annealing twins, for example. But twin, these annealing twins are basically just grains which are in special orientations with respect to their surroundings. So this is a polycrystalline material and optical microscopy has been used for more than a hundred years to study these. And what we can see is the shape and the size of the crystals in the polycrystalline material. And the dark lines between the crystals, we call them grain boundaries. With modern instruments, you can get even more information than this. So, for example, in addition to the shape and size of crystals, the colors in this image represent the crystallographic orientation of the individual crystal relative to the specimen frame of reference. For example, this might be a particular direction uh, in the shape of your object, and this is another direction in the shape of your object, and the colors represent how the crystal axes are oriented with respect to the sample axes. So this is a, a much more uh, detailed information and it's important because sometimes we try to control the orientations of crystals in a polycrystalline material so that we have something between a single crystal and a random polycrystalline sample. I'll come back to this when we discuss texture. Okay, let's think once again about the repeat or the long-range order that we have in crystals. And when we have long-range order in a crystal, we're able to represent that by a very simple unit, which when repeated, reproduces the whole of the repeat pattern of the crystal. Here, for example, we have a square lattice consisting of four points here all of which have exactly the same environment around them. So we call this a unit cell, a square unit cell. And it's called a primitive unit cell because it only has atoms at, uh, only has lattice points at the corners. And those lattice points will be shared with three other squares in the repeat pattern that we eventually form. Similarly, we have a rectangular lattice with 
a lattice point in the middle or a primitive rectangular lattice here. Now in addition, uh, a hexagonal lattice where these angles are 120 degrees and the edges are of equal length. Uh, that's a hexagonal lattice which is primitive with only lattice points at the corner. Um, this, this particular cell is not primitive because it has a lattice point at the corner and one in the middle. So there are two lattice points per cell. Now if I take this hexagonal lattice and make the angle arbitrary and the lengths no longer equal, then I get what's known as an oblique lattice, again a primitive lattice. Now in two dimensions, there are only five possible ways in which you can arrange a regular set of lattice points. That means that in principle, all the wallpapers that you can buy really have five basic patterns in them. So for example, this is a wallpaper you can identify within it a repeat unit. Okay. If I take that block and I simply print it so that all the adjacent blocks match in uh, their origins, then I reproduce the whole of the pattern. So what I'm doing is I'm stacking these two-dimensional rectangular lattices together to generate the whole pattern. So the basic pattern here is very very simple it's a rectangular primitive lattice and we can generate the entire pattern simply by repeatedly printing that simple block uh, which is the unit cell of this pattern now one thing uh, that's important to realize is that a unit cell is not unique in other words I could actually represent this same pattern by choosing another unit cell. For example, here is an oblique unit cell. I can still uh, repeat the pattern by printing that particular block. We simply choose a unit cell which is convenient and which represents the uh, best the symmetry of the lattice. It has the shortest lattice vectors and the angles are reasonable. But in principle, there is an infinite set of unit cells that you could draw for a repeated pattern. There is a caveat. You must be able to stack the unit cells in order to fill all space. <coughs> so for example, this cannot be a unit cell because the next triangle will come here and I will leave an empty space over here. So a unit cell must be able to fill all space when you stack uh, stack it together to represent the whole pattern. Okay, so this is basically our lattice and uh, in this case it's a rectangular lattice and we define that by a unit cell. These are the two basis vectors which define the unit cell A1 and A2 and the magnitudes of these vectors represent the lattice parameters and the angle there represents the, uh, in this case, 90 degrees. I can take the cell and stack it together to reproduce the entire pattern in two dimensions. Now, two-dimensional crystals uh, recently uh, became prominent because graphene, for example, is a two-dimensional material in the sense that it's only one atom layer thick and it consists of a hexagonal array of carbon atoms. So here you are, this is what the graphene uh, structure looks like where each black dot represents a carbon atom. Now if I draw a unit cell which when I repeat will reproduce this entire structure then it would look like this. This is my hexagonal unit cell where the edges are of equal length and the angle here is 120 degrees and I place a carbon atom here and another carbon atom here for every single lattice point so you can see that for every single lattice point I've got a pair of carbon atoms so this is a primitive cell 
because this is not a lattice point, it's environment, the bonds, bonds here are pointing in a different direction to the bonds along here. So this is an example where we have a primitive hexagonal cell, but I've placed a motif, in other words, uh, at every lattice point I've placed a pair of carbon atoms to generate this hexagonal pattern of graphene. And there are other two-dimensional crystals that are useful. For example, uh, molybdenum disulfide. You can produce thin layers, which are very good lubricants. Now, in three dimensions, we just generalize this concept. Uh, we have three uh, vectors forming the unit cell, A1, A2, and A3. These are we call the basis vectors. And the same principles apply that every lattice point must have the same environment, that the unit cell must be space filling. Uh, we are using three basis vectors because we are working in three dimensions and the magnitudes of those vectors A1, A2, A3 are what we call the lattice parameters and we have the angles alpha, beta and gamma between A1, A2, A2, A3 and A3, A1. Now, in three dimensions, there's only 14 possible ways in which you can represent, repeat, uh, a regularly repeating, uh, long-range ordered pattern of points. And these are the 14 Brave lattices. How do we represent directions? Well, uh, if you've got a set of basis vectors, then you can simply take that direction and measure the components it has along those basis vectors. So for example, uh, we can write any vector u as a linear combination of a1, a2, and a3. Uh, and u1, u2, and u3 are the components of that vector, which we call the Miller indices of that direction. And I'm using square brackets here to indicate that we are referring to a direction. So in this case, for example, the vector u is written as 1, 1. In other words, you go 1 along a1 and 1 along a2. In this case, you go 1 along a1 and half along a2. So we could refer to it in square brackets as 1 and a half, but uh, we prefer not to use fractions for Miller indices. So if I convert that to integers, that would be a vector 2, 1, a vector parallel to 2, 1. Uh, here we have uh, the vector u, which would be a bar 1, that means minus 1, and 1 along here, whereas the vector u here would go 2 along a1 and 1 along a2, so we would label that as 2, 1. This uh, red vector has components 1, 1, and 1, so that's the 1, 1, 1 direction, whereas this one does not have any component along A1, so we have 0 along A1, 1 along A2, and 1 along A3, so that's a 0, 1, 1 direction. Now, if you are looking at a cubic lattice, then the fact that I call this the vector A1 is arbitrary. I could have called this a, a1 and then this a2 and this would become a3. So the 1, 0, 0 direction here is actually, oops, is actually crystallographically equivalent to this direction here and to this direction here. So the 1, 0, 0 direction has the same spacing of lattice points as along the 0, 1, 0 direction or the 0, 0, 1 direction or their opposites, bar 1, 0, 0, <coughs> etc. So, to express that briefly, we use these angular brackets, and when we use those angular brackets, we say that the 1, 0, 0 direction the, uh, the f has six possible equivalent directions, which are uh, written in blue over here. So, Brackets like these means directions of that form, whereas square brackets 
are referring to a specific set of basics vectors. In this case, this has to be 1, 0, 0 if I write it like this. But I could say that the elastic modulus along 1, 0, 0 is 200 gigapascals. And that means that it's 200 gigapascals along any one of these equivalent directions. In the case of planes, uh, there's a slightly strange method that we use to identify planes. So a plane is identified by a plane normal. That means a vector pointing at 90 degrees to the plane. And the magnitude of that vector is proportional to uh, 1 upon the spacing of those planes. Okay? Uh, now, why do we do this? Well, a plane normal is actually a vector in reciprocal space. And we haven't dealt with this as yet. I will come back to this later on. Uh, but the way in which we define the components of a vector in reciprocal space is we take the intercepts that the plane makes on these axes. Uh, in this case, it's 1, 1, and a half. We then take the reciprocal of these, and that comes to 1, 1, 2. So the indices of the red plane are 1, 1, 2. Okay. In this case, uh, the intercepts are all along 1 on all the basis vectors. So this plane would be a 1, 1, 1 plane, because the reciprocal of 1 is just 1. Here we have a plane which doesn't intersect A1, but intersects A2 at 1 and doesn't intersect A3. So the intercepts can be written <coughs> as infinity, 1, infinity, and the reciprocal of that would give us 0, 1, 0. Now notice that we use round brackets in order to specify planes. Okay, planes here, we are using round brackets. So that's the convention that we use. Here is a plane which doesn't intersect A1, but intersects A2 and A3 at 1 each. And therefore, this plane would be 0, 1, 1, because it intercepts A1 at infinity and 1 and 1 and therefore we have 0, 1, 1. Now just as in directions, uh, symmetry will mean that planes with different indices or different permutations of indices have the same arrangement of lattice points. So here, for example, the 1, 1, 1 plane is exactly equivalent to a 1, 1, bar 1 plane in a cubic system. Uh, whether it's 1, 1, 1 or 1, 1, bar 1, simply depends on how we defined A1, A2, and A3. But as far as the lattice points are concerned, they are exactly equivalent arrangements of lattice points on those planes. So to express that, we say these are planes of the form 1, 1, 1 using braces over here. So the, the, the set of planes of the form 1, 1, 1 will have 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, bar 1, 1, bar 1, 1, bar 1, 1, 1, 1 and their opposites. Okay, uh, we're going to deal with three-dimensional structures mostly and I want to show you a simple way of visualizing these structures because later on in the course uh, we will have really quite complex crystal structures and it isn't worth drawing three-dimensional diagrams, they just look very messy. So here we have a body-centered cubic lattice. There are lattice points at the corners and one lattice point in the middle of the cube. So <coughs> if we project this structure onto the basal plane here, uh, there is a lattice point located at a half height, which is the body center. So we put down a half here. And these lattice points, which are unlabeled, are at heights 0 and 1. Okay, so it's understood that they are at heights 0 and 1. Here we now have a face-centered cubic cell in which there are, again, lattice points at the corners, but also at the centers of each face. 
Now the lattice point located at the top and the bottom faces <coughs> is here. We don't need to put any labels because that's at a height 0 and 1. And these are the face centers here located at a height half. So it's much easier to visualize this cell as a projection rather than as a three-dimensional structure. This uh, cell is now a primitive cubic cell. And I think that polonium metal is the only structure which has a primitive cubic unit cell. Generally speaking, it isn't uh, stable to arrange atoms directly on top of each other. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so here are the three projections for the three different cubic uh, Bravais lattices. We have the primitive cubic, cubic I representing body-centered cubic, and cubic F where we also have uh, lattice points at the centers of each of the faces. We can describe symmetry uh, with some uh, some operations. Now, if you have a crystal, then there necessarily is translational symmetry, and that's why we can take a very basic unit cell and stack it up to reproduce the whole structure. So that is quite trivial. Without that, we do not have a crystal. But supposing I have a cube and I rotate that cube through 90 degrees okay, around uh, its edge, then clearly I reproduce the cube. Okay. So there is a four-fold rotation axis at the edge of the cube along the 100 type directions. Uh, and that fourfold axis we call a tetrad. A twofold axis would involve a rotation of 180 degrees about that axis, reproducing the structure. And a threefold, uh, so a twofold axis would be called a dyad. A threefold axis would be a rotation of 120 degrees about a particular direction. So that's 360 divided by 120 is a threefold axis, and we call that a triad. And a hexad would be a rotation of 60 degrees about a particular axis. A fivefold axis does not exist because it's not possible to reproduce a repeating structure in three dimensions uh, by an operation which is 360 degrees divided by 5. We may also have a mirror plane in the crystal, in which case when we reflect across the mirror plane, we reproduce the structure entirely. Now, there are some subtle symmetries, which are not obvious when looking at shapes of crystals, but which we can detect through changes in properties or by solving the crystal structure, as we'll discuss uh, in a later lecture. So, a screw axis. Uh, in this case, a screw diode involves a rotation of 180 degrees. Obviously, I don't have anything here, but if I now translate by half the repeat distance, the repeat distance is this. Whoops, sorry. Yeah, if I translate by half the repeat distance along this axis, then I reproduce the object here. So rotate by 180 degrees, translate by half. So these translations are actually very small. Uh, they are basically fractions of the repeat distance. So this is a screw diode because it involves both a rotation and a translation exactly as in a wooden, wooden screw, for example. A glide plane is similar, but we reflect and then do a translation parallel to the glide plane. So it's a, it's a mirror plane combined with a translation. In addition, crystals may have a center of symmetry. So by that, what I mean is that, look, if I take this triangle and invert it through a point in the middle, then I end up with a triangle like this. Okay, So that's a center of symmetry. 
if I deform a crystal that has a center of symmetry, then the atoms will be displaced symmetrically about that center of symmetry. And if those atoms are charged, then there is no net dipole left. However, if I do not have a center of symmetry, then by deforming a crystal, I might produce a dipole, and that's known as piezoelectricity. So these are the uh, symmetry operations that we will look at in uh, the lectures that follow. Now, before the advent of uh, diffraction and the Bragg law and so on, much of crystallography was worked out by looking at the shapes of crystals which are close to their equilibrium shapes. And the seven different crystal systems each have their own defining symmetries. So for example, a material cannot be cubic if you cannot find three fourfold rotation axes or triads. Sorry, three <coughs> four <coughs> material cannot be cubic if you cannot find four threefold rotation axes. These are the body diagonals of the cube. There will be four such axes and rotation by 120 degrees about these axes will bring the cube into coincidence. So the defining symmetry of anything being cubic is that there must be four triads. For hexagonal, there must be a hexad. That's, uh, that's quite obvious. And so on. So by just looking at what sort of symmetry an object has, you could actually determine which crystal class it belongs to. We'll do these exercises later on. So here is a summary of the 14 Brave lattices. And I said to you that it's not uh, really terribly useful to look at these in three dimensions. So here are the projections of the 14 Brave lattices. Much simpler to look at. Now, in the case of uh, iron, we have two major phases. Uh, we have the body-centered cubic ferrite and the face-centered cubic austenite. And the phase diagram for pure iron as a function of temperature and pressure looks like this, that at ambient pressure we have body-centered cubic iron stable until uh, high temperatures, and then we have the face-centered cubic iron stable, but it reverts back to body-centered cubic iron here. Along the pressure axis, I get another form of iron, which is uh, hexagonal, close-packed, epsilon iron. But that occurs at very, very high pressures. Now, the reason why we go from body-centered cubic to face-centered cubic and back to body-centered cubic is because the magnetic free energy term of alpha iron becomes very important and stabilizes the alpha iron relative to the face centered cubic iron. Now, in the center of the Earth, where we have a huge amount of pressure and uh, a temperature of the order of 6000 Kelvin, it is uh, known that we have a very large solid lump of iron which is likely to be hexagonal close packed according to calculations that we, we can do for the stability of phases under those circumstances. So there's a very large lump of this hexagonal close packed form of iron in the middle of the earth. Now, supposing that we did not have magnetism, then alpha iron would not be stable at room temperature. Instead, this epsilon phase field would extend to ambient conditions. The problem with uh, a hexagonal close back structure is that it has very few slip systems. So you have the basal plane and you have three slip directions in that basal plane. And for a material in polycrystalline form to be ductile, you need five independent slip systems. So, 
we have magnetism to thank for civilization it is, as it exists because we use something like 1.4 billion tons of steel every year and if we did not have body centered cubic iron it would be a much less useful material because hexagonal iron is not as ductile as body centered cubic iron simply because of the limitations of the number of slip systems. So crystallography is extremely important in understanding the properties of engineering materials and in the periodic table iron, ruthenium and osmium have similar outer electron structures in other words they are chemical equivalents but ruthenium and osmium are not magnetic whereas alpha iron is ferromagnetic so alpha iron is body centered cubic but these two are actually hexagonal closed packed and we can prove the role of magnetism because in these first principles calculations hexagonal closed packed iron turns out to be the most stable form of iron under ambient conditions if we eliminate ferromagnetism so I repeat again that Without the magnetic properties of iron, we would not have civilization as we know it now. Simply because we would not have such a wonderful material to build our structures, engineering structures from. Okay, now I'm going to finish the lecture today and continue with crystal structures. That means we start putting clusters of atoms at each lattice point to build uh, real structures. Lattice points are imaginary. It's only when we place atoms at each lattice point that it becomes a real material. Thank you.